it's a big, it's a big, wonderful, messy field. <laughs> UFOs. There's a lot more going on in this world, I think, than we are, you know, trained when we grow up to believe. Do you remember the buildup? <laughs> oh yeah. For December 21, 2012. You remember it too. I was once asked that question on Coast to Coast uh, with George Norrie. And he said in that, in that wonderful way of his, Richard, what's the greatest <laughs> UFO story in your opinion? Hello, everybody. A warm welcome to Wisdom from North. My name is Janneke and I'm now in New York City on my Wisdom from North tour around the U.S. And I'm sitting here with the brilliant Richard Dolan. He's one of the leading historians of the UFO phenomenon in the world. And he's the author of the historical series, The Groundbreaking uh, UFOs and the National Security State, which he co-wrote with Bryce Zabel. Now, he's coming out with a new book, and it's called UFOs uh, for the 21st Century Mind. Is that right? That's, yeah, so that's, that's yeah. exactly right. That's <laughs> Very exactly. good. Yeah. Richard, much, much welcome to Wisdom from North. Janneke, it's so nice to be uh, meeting with you again. You know, we had a, a wonderful interview about a year ago in Oslo. Yeah, and I'm yeah. so happy we get to connect again and yeah. that it happened to be so that you were in New York City now. Absolutely. Um, I should mention I co-authored uh, the book A.D. After Disclosure with Bryce Zabel and my two volumes of UFOs and the National Security State, those are mine. Uh, those are my two volumes. And there will be a third volume of that. Mm. It's on the way. Mm -hmm. But I had this other book that's coming out right now in the next month called UFOs for the 21st Century Mind. Yeah, and let's talk about that book uh, because I've read parts of it. And uh, what can people expect? What, what is coming? Well, um, you can think of it as a, as a new, fresh introduction to the entire topic. Uh, you know, when I look around at the field of UFOs, I see a couple of things. One is that it's a field in great transformation in, in a number of ways, mainly because of the world that we live in is in such transformation. And the field of UFO study has itself gone through a lot of changes in the last 20 years. And then the other thing that I notice is, is that there really is not a good single volume introduction to the whole subject. I mean, we all have friends who have some interest in this topic. And if you have a person like that and you think, well, I'd like them to have a really good book to read to get them interested in this in a sophisticated way, but in a good introductory way. There really isn't, in my opinion, a, a good book like that. And that's actually what I've tried to do here. So it's a nice length. It's about 300 pages, not too much, not like my histories, which are big, fat books. The book will be out, um, I think, before the end of the summer of 2013. Mm -hmm. That is my dearest hope. Can't wait. And I've read parts of it, like I said. And um, I thought it was very interesting um, to read the history chapter uh, about how f long we have seen UFOs. Can you say a little bit about that? Like, how long have we, have, uh, we seen signs and in what way? Yes, absolutely. We've, well, as long as people have been on the earth, it looks like we've been seeing strange things that we cannot explain. We have, um, you know... We only invented writing about 6,000 years ago. We've been around much longer than that. So we've only had written stories for that long a period of time. But even earlier than that, there are, of course, some interesting rock uh, paintings that a lot of people have heard about. Uh, the problem with the paintings is simply that they have no words to go with them, so that we, we're, we're somewhat out of a loss to interpret them. But Look, if you're not afraid to look at some of these interesting images, they're fascinating. Uh, one of my favorites to, to look at, uh, I think many people have noticed, um, the Australian Wajina. Uh, these are the Aborigines. They, these rock uh, cave drawings are about 5,000 years old. And uh, they're quite fascinating, of course. In Australian Aborigine culture, the Wajina are known as sky beings beings from the heavens. Uh, and in fact, in their mythology, one of the beings actually became the Milky Way itself, you know, the white stream in the sky. Well, if you look at images of these Wajina, of course, they don't, not only do they not look like Australian Aborigines, they don't look like any human being whatsoever. They look 
more than anything else, like our depiction of the greys, the grey aliens. They've got big black eyes, large white heads, bald. And there's just all of these images. And, and you have to wonder, well, what what is this possibly all about? In uh, the American West, out in Utah, in particular, at places like Sago Canyon and elsewhere, there are also a number of very interesting and similar looking images of very, very large beings with large eyes. We don't really know what those are, but they are certainly def definitely interesting. Now, as you move forward in human history, we have um, some other interesting anomalies, things that just don't easily make sense. Some of these were discussed in the TV show Ancient Aliens, and I think a lot of people are familiar with like the Great Pyramid at Giza. Uh, that's always been a fascination of mine. Hmm. Uh, in the sense that when you really look at the mathematics and the engineering, the construction of that particular pyramid, I have to tell you, I do not see how the ancient Egyptians put that together. Mm. I just can't see it. None of the explanations that the conventional Egyptologists say make any sense to me. So to me, what I would say when I look at the ancient human history is that there is a big hole in our history. There's some, something important that we're not getting. Is it Atlantis? Is it something like that? Maybe, I don't know. Yeah, and it was very interesting because you said, how is it possible that the human race is evolving so fast compared right. to other species like the dinosaurs, for instance? Yeah, that's, that's right. I, I forgot I wrote that in there. And it is a, it's a fascinating thing. When you look at human evolution, the, the official evolutionary uh, timeline that we have, the thing that really stands out about humanity is how rapidly we've evolved. Uh, four million years ago, which... In, in geological times, it's not very much. Uh, there was Australopithecus, which basically looked like a chimp, except that they could walk upright, but everything else about them, they looked like a chimpanzee. And from that, in a mere four, four million years, we, we come to this. Uh, it's a very, very rapid evolution. And in the last even one million years, it's been very, very rapid. So, um, of course, that leads to the theory, have we been managed and manipulated genetically? Uh, this is a, a theory, certainly, that I explore. Mm -hmm. What I try to do in, in this book is to open up all of these ideas, and it's not for me, and it's really not for anyone that I am aware of, to make a final determination, to say, yes, this happened, no, this didn't happen. I mean, the fact is that I don't know. I don't have every single answer. I don't think I'll ever have every single answer. These are, some of them are genuine mysteries. But I try to elaborate on them and try to explain them in an interesting way so that people can be engaged in it. Um, but I do think that human evolution is an interesting um, story, and it's, it's interesting in, the, in its speed. Uh, there are theories, and I write about these in the book, that, that hypothesize that our evolution was assisted by other beings, others somehow, uh, that human brain development was assisted and so forth in this in this manner. It's not a completely unscientific theory. There is some scientific support for it, not necessarily proof, but there's at least reason to wonder about it, and I have that in the book. Uh, as you move forward in time, once we start having the ability to write our own stories, what you find is that there are some pretty fascinating UFO stories. Mm -hmm. Going back to ancient Egypt, Mm -hmm. uh, there's one from uh, around uh, 1600 BC, around that time, I believe. And I describe it. It was uh, during the reign of, um, oh gosh, it was during the um, dynasty of Ak Akhenaten and King Tut and that whole dynasty, in which it was written down by the scribes of this apparition coming from the sky for several days, this mm -hmm. bright, fiery thing, whatever it was, that scared the hell out of the Egyptians, and they went to the pharaoh. Hmm. No one knew what this was. It was This object was then joined by many other similar bright objects in the sky, burning brighter than the sun for several days. Um, it was somewhat menacing, and they maneuvered in the sky, according to the Egyptians, and then they just went away. So what is that? There are a couple of these types of stories in ancient times, and here's the thing. You can read them, and what most scholars would do or what most people would do is say, okay, great, whatever, and then they would just forget about it. Hmm. Or they would say, well, they were ancient people. What did they know? Maybe uh, they 
you know, misunderstood a simple meteorological phenomenon, but I don't think so. I mean, there's just enough of these very explicit ancient stories that, again, I wonder, were they seeing something truly unusual? I give them a lot of credit. I think they were at least as intelligent, maybe more intelligent than we are today. So I think why not, uh, at least, you know, for the time being, accept the fact that the ancient people might have been able, might have been seeing what they claim to have seen. Uh, there are a number of these. Uh, as you get even further into the modern era, the 16th and 17th centuries and the 18th centuries, I, I think people would be surprised at the number of pretty good stories uh, of very bizarre things in the sky. And I say pretty good. There were no UFO investigative organizations back in the 18th century. So there's no one doing an interview of witnesses and trying to do a scientific analysis of it. So we don't have that. But we've got some very intelligent accounts of oddities. In the 19th century, there's one fascinating one that um, was a newspaper account at the time, a ship's captain off the coast of Sicily in the Mediterranean in 1845 saw an object come out of the Mediterranean Sea, hover for a short while, and fly off. That's an actual account. Now, were they all drunk? Who knows, right? We'll never know. But there are a number of, again, compelling and interesting stories like this. So my feeling is there's probably been someone that's been here for a long time. So that's all in my chapter, just my one chapter on ancient UFOs. What about the crop circles? Uh, is that more recent that we've seen that, or, or is that an ancient thing too? Another good question. Well, it was believed for a while that it was a completely modern phenomenon. Uh, some of the researchers say no. Of course, there's a famous image from England, uh, a woodcut from uh, the 17th century, I believe it is, 1600s, uh, in which they describe the mowing devil. So in other words, there was a phenomenon apparently that long ago, in which these formations would appear, and there was no explanation for them. So it could be it could be somewhat ancient. The only thing is we don't have a whole lot of uh, data about those earlier years, but it certainly it seems like there's something going on back then. Uh, more recently, of course, uh, from the middle of the 20th century onward, I think uh, Colin Andrews, who's a one of the major crop circle researchers, has stated that at least from 1940, there have been some pr pretty good formations in the UK, in the United Kingdom. Uh, the, the, the whole phenomenon really takes off around 1980 and, and goes forward from there. And um, here's the thing. There are some extraordinary, I mean, unbelievable formations that seeming that come up overnight or seemingly overnight and, um, you know, when I've, I, I do write about this in the book, and I'm not a crop circle expert, but I've talked to them all at this point. I know them all, and I've had some very in-depth conversations with these people. There's a definite real phenomenon going on, but what people have to understand is that the man-made crop circle phenomenon, mm. especially in England, really is dominant. Mm. So... The, the people who go to the crop circle formations to kind of feel the energy, 90% of the times or more, they're in a man-made field. Mm. There, now, there are, there are ways of determining that if it's man-made or not, and the, the most sure way is you study the stalks themselves. You study the nodes of the stalks. The nodes are like the knuckles on your finger. Mm. And uh, probably a lot of people are familiar with this by now. But what we find in some of the most the baffling formations is that the nodes are, the, the stalks are bent at the node and they're blasted out. Mm. And there's no way to replicate that by a wooden plank. We, there's just no known way to do that. The only way that they've been able partially to repli replicate it is through localized uh, microwave energy. Like if you put them in a microwave oven, you heat the moisture inside the stalk and the node is the weakest part. So the moisture comes out and it blasts through, and then the, the, stock, the stock falls over at the node. Now, you think about how amazing that is, right? So you're in a, 
uh, for, formation, this enormous formation that's complex, and the, the stalks have fallen over because of heat from inside the stalk that causes it to flop over uh, a cup like a foot or a meter above the ground. What, what the heck is that? So those formations are, I mean, they're inexplicable in any conventional way. So do you have any theory of why uh, there are so many in Britain and not in the U.S., for instance? Well, actually, there are quite a few in the U.S., as we're finding out. Oh. Now, not as many, but, but the United States, uh, in central U.S., like in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, uh, that region of the U.S. in particular, there are a number of uh, circle formations. And in fact, from everything that I've been able to learn, the percentage of genuine crop circles in the U.S. is actually quite a bit higher mm -hmm. than in the U.K. Hmm. There's much more fakery now going on in the U.K. because it's become a really big, almost like yeah. a business. Not as, I wouldn't say a business, but there's been a lot of circle artists mm -hmm. who have really gotten into the game there. Mm -hmm. The question why they're there is, you know, this is, I mean, a lot of the, the crop circle experts aren't 100% sure. It's related to, to uh, bodies of water. It could be related to what we call ley lines. Mm. Uh, there, that, that's one argument. Um, in the United States, I had a very long conversation with a, a leading circle researcher who made a very strong case that they are related to ancient sites of uh, Native American sacred sites. And I, I think he's right. So if that's the case, now we're talking about something that's really quite profound. Um, is it in, you know, the real question regarding the circles is, is it from a directed intelligence from elsewhere, or is it, a, is it some kind of natural earth geomagnetic energy? Mm -hmm. And I don't really know what the answer is. Mm. Um, I don't know. Um, let's move into something I'm curious about. Um, all these different types of alien and extraterrestrial beings. How many different species, <laughs> in a way, have you uh, been investigating? Right, right. <laughs> to well, get like uh, the picture, the whole picture. Yeah. This is complicated because one thing that people need to understand is that I do believe that there is an abduction phenomenon. I do believe that there is an, an encounter phenomenon. But it's also, uh, it seems to me, that there's a great deal of memory manipulation that goes on in these encounters. I'll give you one example, and then I will answer your question. But uh, I did an extended interview with a gentleman um, about a year ago who is a truck driver. He had an experience about 30 years ago with three other people. They were fishing at night, okay, on a nice little lake in Ohio. And... Um, the last thing he remembered is a light coming down very bright, and they were just getting scared in, the, in their boat. And then the next thing he remembered, they're all on the shore. He doesn't know how they got to the shore, and they are all screaming. There's a huge craft directly above them, and they're screaming, they're coming to get us. Well, in fact, they had already come to get them because they had been missing three hours of time, turns out. But here's the thing. The first thing he says to them, his three companions is, if any of you ever talk about this, I'll deny it and I'll call all of you liars. And then he said, we must never talk about this ever again. And when he was telling me the story, he said, why would I say that? Like, why would I um, tell him that? Mm -hmm. And he believes, and I, I believe, that whoever took them created a kind of command in their mind and said, you're never going to talk about this. Mm -hmm. So in other words, these groups, whoever they are, have a very profound ability to manage human memory and also to create screen memories. Now, having said that, you're talking about the races that are here or may be here. The reason I think that we may never really know for sure is because the memories that people have, you have all of these variations on the theme. There are different kinds of greys, for example, that people have seen. So who are the greys? Uh, right. So is it one type of grey or is it many types of greys? And I'm not sure we know. But I do think there are beings called greys. Mm -hmm. they, they turn up many, many, many times in people's recollections. Mm -hmm. 
you know, there are at least two fundamental types of grays that come up in the research, a very short and a taller. The short grays are more common. They seem to be the workers. They, they're the ones that if you wake up on, a, on the table in an abduction, they're the ones that you see, and they're moving around and they're doing the things that they do to uh, keep you in your place. And there's a taller gray who is always described as like the leader and uh, is really running, running things. And this taller gray will often get right up to the person and do what, um, what one researcher called mind scan, huh. where they basically read your mind. And it's a complete telepathic connection. Um, it's a hard thing to say, oh, yes, this is definitely happening. But all, all that I will say is when I look at the research of, of many of the abduction researchers that I, I've personally spoken to at length, I'm inclined to think that this is true. So that's one type of – so these are beings. Now, what are they? Are they pure biological or are they artificially created? My feeling is that they're probably, to some extent, artificially modified or created in some way. Mm -hmm. That's my feeling. I mean, we're moving into an era right now where we are, we've basically mapped the whole human genome, or a lot of it. Uh, we're at a point where we're able to regenerate human organs. We're able to, and we're going to be doing something known as 3D printing, which will actually be able to create biological tissue, like if a replacement heart or a replacement organ. Oh, this is actually going to happen. So is it impossible to do 3D printing of a human or of an alien being? Maybe not. Maybe not impossible. So I think, I think these grays are probably artificially created to some extent. Because to me, when I look at their shape and everything, it doesn't make sense. What do you mean? Them. They're not real in a way? They're real. They're real, and they're, they're probably biological, but... They're probably genetically enhanced, and they may, for all we know, have um, artificial uh, chips inside them as well to enhance their intelligence. We, we ourselves in our civilization are at the doorstep of being able to do that. We're going to have, it's very possible, have nano chips put inside our brains. And I mean, it's crazy yeah, as it's scary. Sound, it is a little bit. Mm -hmm. And people, if they think UFOs are a little crazy, they should start reading on some of the future technology developments that are coming right down the road. So uh, cybernetic, that is part machine, part biological uh, developments in our own species are probably on the way. So I, I, my assumption is that these are probably what the grays are. It makes the most sense to me. But you have grays, you have, uh, you have many cases of completely human looking beings, but they don't, they don't seem, they don't act like human beings. They're different ways. Now, are they exactly human beings? Well, they're very telepathic. They seem to be very standoffish. I, I have personally gotten a number of accounts from individuals who are, are totally credible, in my opinion, who discuss encounters with human-looking beings that communicate telepathically with them and then say things like, go away, you have no business here, go about your business, leave us alone. You know, I mean, crazy stories, but I've gotten them enough enough times that I think. So there, there's this human group, and look, really, if but mm -hmm. could maybe the um, could it be that they are able to transform themselves that they're not really um, look like humans? Who knows? Or, yeah. Who knows? Maybe uh, the, you get claims by people like you know David Ike and some others about shape shifting yeah. reptilians who can look. I don't really know how true that could be, or. Um, you know, initially when you hear a theory like that, you think, oh, that's crazy. Who would, who would believe that? But then you hear, you know, there's so much that's You never know. <laughs> no, right. Uh, one of the things that I try to do <clears throat> in this book and really in, in all of my work is, um, you know, you want to be open-minded because this is, this is a very a crazy world we live in. And there's a lot more going on in this world, I think, than we are, you know, trained when we grow up to believe in. On the other hand, we, we can't lose the scientific method to the extent possible in this. I mean, we, we still have to do our best to be rational. We still have to do our best to wait for evidence and to uh, make provisional conclusions, not definite conclusions, until we get better evidence. And that's just 
that's the situation we're in. It's not always satisfying. You, everyone wants proof, but we have to recognize how strong or how weak proof our proof is. And if the proof is just not there, but if we have some interesting stories and interesting evidence, then you have to go with that, and you have a provisional conclusion. And that's really where I'm at with a lot of this. But do you also um, research people who have said that they have this ability to channel, you know, either sure. the Pleiadians, <clears throat> I've heard of the Arcturians, and they sound like more highly evolved people uh, and more benevolent than the Greys. Right. That's that's a big part of what I deal with in this new book. That's a that's part of the UFO culture, if we can call it that. So what do we say about people who claim to be channeling or claim to be getting downloads? Often that's the word that they'll use mm. uh, to get information from a higher intelligence. Some of these higher intelligences are said to be extraterrestrial. Not all. Some are just higher dimensional entities and the, the word extraterrestrial doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. Are they really from another planet? Mm. Are they from another reality? Whatever they are. But all of this is part of the UFO cultural experience these days. So it is important for me in my own mind to think, you know, what, what's my take on it. Um, I don't dismiss this. I don't dismiss uh, these at least offhand. One reason that I don't is simply because I've studied enough of remote viewing to believe that that's real, that's legitimate. There are remote viewers, um, many of whom are world famous. A, a lot of them I've, I've known. Uh, I, was, uh, I knew the late Ingo Swan. I spent an evening in his home once. It was kind of cool. Right here in New York City, actually, many years ago. Uh, there's others who are equally well known or off the charts, excellent. There's something going on that allows a human being to see things remotely in space and time. It's happened. In my opinion, I'm satisfied that this is true. So there's this ability that we have. So at least in theory, I'm willing to uh, believe that there could be people who've had other types of communications with other beings. But here's the thing. I've had a lot of people who've said that they channel Pleiadians, for example. But um, I am a, I'm a little skeptical of a lot of this, and the reason is simply because when they make predictions, the predictions inevitably have turned out to be false. I'm not aware of really true predictions or interesting true predictions. Like, um, you know, we've, we've just, we're in 2013, and we've just passed December 21st, 2012. And remember the build-up? Do you remember the build-up? <laughs> oh, yeah. For December 21, 2012. You remember it, too. And, uh, and that was going to be the Great Ascension. And a lot of that was derived from channeled information, where it was said that we were going to move to a new level, a new density. A new, and it, but aren't we? Well, we may be, but I don't think it's triggered by that particular date. There's, I've never seen any evidence. Uh, December 21th came and went, and it was just another day. Now, I think a century from now, when human beings look back on our time, I do think it's very possible that they'll say humanity went through a shift. They went through a major transformation, and maybe they'll think 2012 is as good a year as any to, to pin it down. Um, I mean, really, this shift is taking... It's a number of years. It's not like one day. But my point simply is this. There were a lot of predictions. Uh, there was that Japanese princess lady. I forget her name. She's out there who said there were going to be three days of darkness in the prelude of December 21 and then a great transformation. And um, didn't happen. All right. So when you get these people who are channeling Pleiadians or other groups – and they start making predictions, I do think they need to be held accountable. Mm. Um, and this is, it's important to I me mean, because, look, it's possible that they're tapping into something, but, uh, again, they, there, is, there are still rules of evidence, in my opinion. Yeah, but there aren't only predictions. It's messages of love and yeah. uh, knowledge and well, uh, wisdom. <clears throat> are these being... The question is, uh, has, having completely setting aside the value 
of the statements. All right, so the statements often are very beautiful and very true. That's, you know, who's going to argue with uh, creating Christ consciousness within oneself? Clearly, that's a good thing to do. But the real question, of course, is are these actually being channeled? Yeah. All right, so that's a different issue. Uh, certainly the message is one thing that you can take, and if it speaks to your heart, and if it sounds right, then accept it by all means. But the question that I ask, and that I think we're incum it's incumbent upon us to ask, is are these actually being channeled? Um, that's an independent issue.